please subscribe to help you and your motorcycle perform better. Dave Williams, Testing Monkey here. It's actually me that's going to be the monkey test pilot for this Hypersport tire test because Moss is too busy answering 300 emails a day, literally. So how is this test going to play out? How are we conducting it? The minimum goal is to put about 2,000 miles or 3,200 kilometers on each set of tires. That's the minimum. It would be nice to put 10,000 miles and 16,000 kilometers on every tire, but I don't have the rear, I don't have the derriere to accomplish that. So what could we do? We could mount up one set and we could put 2,000 miles on it. And then we could mount up another set and put 2,000 miles on it. If we did that, if we put on a set in, say, April, and we did 2,000 miles, 500 miles a week, and then we swapped them out and put another set on in May, and another set on in June, and then another set on in July, well, that wouldn't be very fair would it? Because the tire in July is going to get cooked, so the tire wear wouldn't be even. Plus, how would I keep track of all my routes? Maybe in April I'd be lazy and I would be doing all slab rides down in the valley, highway rides because the mountains are too cold. I live in the foothills of the Sierra Mountains. And then by July I'd be doing all mountain rides because it's way too hot, 110 degrees, what, 45 degrees Celsius down in the valley. If you've watched the previous episodes, you know that each set is mounted on its own set of wheels. Voila. So what I do is I ride in four day blocks. I start with one tire. I come back from the ride. I swap it out for the next set of tires. I do that. And then the fourth set of tires becomes the first set of tires for the next week. So with that scheme, I'm also rotating which set of tires is the first set on a given route because I tend to ride the first day on a route slower than the last day when I've got it more dialed in. Let me make a confession here at the outset. I don't have the mental fortitude to ride at knee down speeds on the road. I just can't mentally make that leap. I'm always afraid something like this will happen and it's just around the next corner. For those of you that can do it, hats off to you. I just can't bring myself to do it. I'm too wimpy. As to whether you should be doing it, or I should be doing it for that matter, is a totally separate discussion. If you would like to have that discussion, email me, timefuser at yahoo.com. As for routes, I try to mix it up a bit. I have quite a choice. I live at about 2,000 feet in the Sierra Nevada mountains, so I've got great canyon rides above me, and I have a big, flat San Joaquin Valley where they grow all the oranges, like 50% of all the oranges in the world are grown down there. So I can do highway rides, just slab rides, or I can do just canyon rides, or I can mix them up. Regardless, I do the same route each day over the four days. There's one route I'll probably do for the bulk of the test going forward, probably 90% of the time. It's a great mix of slab into the mountains, probably about a third highway slab, and then into the canyon twisties. It goes up, up the next canyon over through the mountains and comes down the canyon towards my house. It allows me to fuel up at the Indian Reservation gas station, which has the best prices. I'm getting about 45 miles to the gallon, 70 kilometers to the gallon. A gallon's about four liters. I don't know, you gotta do the math for you liter people. Towards the end of the riding season, in the beginning of September, that's what we're shooting for, we will end the road portion of the test and we will take the tires to the track. Each tire will get a full track day, at least seven sessions. So we'll try and do that in September and group the days together so that the temperatures at the track are relatively the same. Each, all the days will be done at the same track. And then we will have our final analysis. Now there's one variable that we can't really factor out and that's geometry, the pitch of the bike. Now if you watch the first couple of episodes, you know that the tires do drastic things to the pitch of the bike, depending on which set is on there. I will say that the geometry is as neutral as we can get it. However, it does favor one set of tires more than the others. 
it would take too much effort for me to change the geometry every day in addition to changing the tires in order to do that. However, before we go to the track, Dave will do a geometry episode in which we will monkey and tinker with the geometry until we get what that is for each tire, factor it out for a day or two, let Dave ride it and give an evaluation of the tires where the geometry is fully eliminated. But for now, I'm just putting miles on, miles on the tire, kilometers on the tire, and the geometry we don't think will be that much of a factor in that scenario. Geometry will be a serious factor at the track, a serious variable. So we will do each set of tires at the track with the geometry appropriate to that tire. What about the weather as a variable? Well, in the spring, of course, it was very sketchy. So my goal was to block out four days that were relatively the same versus four days that were radically different. And of course, if the weather looks something like this, me being the wimpy Californian fair weather friend that I am, I abandon riding altogether. Another confession. Over the last 20 years, I've probably ridden less than a thousand miles on the road. In the meantime, I've racked up thousands and thousands and thousands of miles at the track. Why, you might ask? Because of confession number one and my mental incapacity to ride at knee down speeds on the road. I've lived here in the Sierras for about three years, so in riding the motorcycle, I'm finding all sorts of new roads that I've never ridden before. Some of them are quite bad. This has required me to really look at the suspension. Remember, Dave says you want to set up your suspension for how you ride on the roads you ride. So suspension in these canyon roads needs to be tighter than suspension for the highway. And then suspension for these crazy pothole, horrible roads, I gotta think about that too. Some of those roads I won't ride anymore. Here's an example. After that first ride on the Yokel Road, where the pavement is so horrible, did it on the Rosso 2s, smashed the travel flat. So rather than add some more preload, because I'm getting close to max preload, I'm going to add some compression. And this is from all those potholes on that road. So we will add, let's see where we're at. We are half one half, one and a half turns out. So we're going to go to one turnout. Do that on the other side. And we'll see how that goes tomorrow when we do the S22s on the same road. Well, raise, raise that. Look at this pavement. Look at that pavement. It's terrible pavement. I think this original pavement, this has got to be from like 1940. So we're down to one line left on the suspension. 
The zip tie is buried. We went in with compression, so it's from one and a half turns out to one turn out. This bumpy road is killing me. I don't want to make it super harsh by closing the compression more. So I'm going to add two more turns of preload so I'll only have one turn left from all the preload in. Just experimenting here. I haven't consulted Mr. Moss. So we got one, two, three turns left. So we're just gonna go There we go. So we will be one turn. This one should be the same. One, two, three. So we will go one turn from maximum from all the preload in. See what we get out of this super bumpy road this time. At the end of that gnarly canyon road, I stopped and checked the zip tie. Looks good, I think I nailed it. I reset the zip tie for the ride home on the slab highway roads. At the fuel station, I checked the zip tie again. It's a little shy on travel, but I got a compromise somewhere. So I reset the zip tie for the slightly canyonish road, twisty road back to the house. Once I got there, I see I used a little bit more travel. I think I've got the perfect compromise. I'm going to sacrifice some comfort and travel on the highway roads so that I can have the stability I need in the canyons and over the bumpy roads. The Bridgestone S22s and the Pirelli Rosso 2s have these little design patterns, logo patterns in the tread. They're very shallow, so it'll be interesting to see at what mileage, at what point, those little uh, design features are worn away. Lastly, let's talk about pressures. Pressure, pressure, pressure. What pressure should I use? If you've watched the previous episodes or anything about Dave Moss and tire pressures, you know he has a particular fondness for the 3642 pressure that is universal across all bikes and all generations. We started this with all the tires at 36 front, 42 rear. It's stamped on the bike, don't you know, in 2004, before any of these tires were even designed. I rode those pressures for two weeks, and it was quite interesting. The Dunlops were brutal. The Rosos were a little better, not much. The S22s, you could begin to detect it that they were better, and then of course the Michelin Power 5s, they were great in comparison to the others. After a couple of weeks, I switched to the Dave Moss recommended pressures. For the Bridgestone S22, 34.5 PSI front and rear. For the Dunlop Q3 Plus, 33 PSI front and rear. For the Michelin Power 5, 36 front and rear. And for the Pirelli Rosso 2, Again, 33 front and rear, just like the Dunlop, because their carcass constructions are quite similar. And of course, the S22 is a little bit softer, and the Power 5 is the softest carcass, most pliable, malleable carcass of them all. We'll finish out the test at the Dave Moss recommended pressures, because at those pressures, the Dunlop and the Pirelli got some compliance all the super harshness on the bumps, I mean, it was demonstrable. They rode more like the um, Michelin Power 5s at the 4236, because of course, the rear just dropped to 36 as well. So the front was, the 36 originally was the Moss recommended 36. So the Dunlop and the Pirelli 
actually smoothed out. The Michelin really didn't change much and the Rosso changed a bit as well, got better. So with those pressures, it's easier to evaluate how the tire is affecting the handling of the motorcycle rather than deflecting off the bumps because the tire won't absorb anything. And remember, the tire is 10, 15-ish percent of your suspension in the first place. Mr. Moss will be back down here shortly and we'll have an evaluation on the tires at about the thousand mile mark, somewhere right in there, maybe a little less. And he will do a tire read and we'll see where we're going and what we need to do. Dave Moss can tune your suspension no matter where you are on the planet via his remote tuning service. Contact Dave on Facebook or by email, dave at davemosstuning.com.